Hello. Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you all for joining us this morning for our webinar as part of the Recovery Festival this week. Um, today, we're going to be talking about young carers. Um, and I see some of you uh, joining us. We're more and more joining us as we go on. Um, and some of you may be young carers. Some of you may be supporting young carers um, or just wanting to know more. Uh, about this uh, topic. So uh, today I'll be joined by my colleague Sophie Kavanagh. My name is Elaine Donnelly. I'm uh, one of the social workers here in St. Patrick's Mental Health Services um, and we'll be talking a little bit about how to support your well-being as a young care, care and maybe some of the issues that come up um, for young carers that are unique uh, in their family role. So I'll just go ahead and share my slides. So as I mentioned, today is really a space for young carers. Um, so it's a time to consider their own needs for support and emotional care. And you yourself may not be a young carer, but as I said, you might be supporting somebody in this role, like, or you might be, you, you yourself might be experiencing mental health difficulties and are conscious of a younger person within your household and maybe wanting to know more about how to support them in their role. Um, so this is about helping young carers to access information and to navigate to relevant services and supports. Unfortunately, historically, because of uh, the way mental health services have been developed, young carers are often hidden within services and, and, and they haven't always been out front and centre. And so the services maybe that are available to them are a little bit less developed, but there are really good supports available that we want to highlight today and make sure that people are aware uh, that of what help is available to them. We also want to recognise the unique, vital role that young carers play, particularly in times of illness and crisis, um, because very often that isn't recognised. Um, and for some, it's, it's because we don't recognise it ourselves. So sometimes when you're supporting somebody else, it's called caring, and you're a carer if you provide unpaid support or care for someone who has an illness, disability, mental health problem or addiction. Um, so even if you do spend a lot of time supporting somebody else, you might not consider yourself a carer and you might not feel like it doesn't count. Um, that might be because you think it's your responsibility to care for your relative or your friend or your parent or your sibling. Um, that you're providing support that's other than physical and practical support. So support that might not be as visible. Um, you think the role of carers is defined by social services and care is provided by them. So that's just coming to some of the reasons why people often say that they don't count themselves as a carer. And that's important to highlight um, because very often people are involved in caring roles um, and not validating that position. And, and that does not allow them to get the support or help that they might need. So when we're talking specifically about young carers, we're talking about a young carer who is somebody under the age of 18 whose life is impacted or potentially restricted because of the need to take care of a relative. So this is distinct from a young adult carer, so that's somebody over the age of 18, but maybe up until the age of 25. Um, so really we're focusing on those who might be under the age of 18, who might be uh, supporting somebody at, their in, in, at home uh, with caring responsibilities. So that might be their sibling, it might be their parent, uh, it might be a grandparent. It really depends on, on the individual circumstances. I suppose we say across the board, not just to young carers, uh, that caring for somebody with a mental health condition can be really difficult. And the invisibility of the illness can make it feel like you're not a real carer. And, and it's very important to acknowledge that you are and that um, being in a caring role is making a huge difference to somebody else's life. Um, often with difficult times, but also rewarding times as well, which we'll talk about now in a moment. Um, so what are we talking about when we're talking about caring? Um, so young carers are often involved in domestic help, so like helping around the house, um, maybe putting the bins out, maybe helping with cooking, helping with shopping, uh, helping with cleaning at home. Um, it might be around general health with care, maybe if somebody has physical health needs. It might be helping somebody with taking their medication or helping them, you know, with uh, they're moving around the house or getting out of the house, for example. 
it might be providing support, uh, emotional support. So maybe listening to what might be going on for somebody, helping them when they're in times of distress, helping them maybe when they're in times of anxiety or panic. And um, it also might involve looking after others in the house. Um, it could also involve intimate care or looking out to other services outside of the home, maybe seeking help, help with paying bills, doing things on behalf of the household. So it can really vary um, what caring involves. And it's important to note that there are lots of different domains and different tasks. And sometimes they might change. So they're, they're not always, you might not be doing all of these things all of the time, but you might, uh, they might, the needs of the person you're caring for might go up and down. Um, as is generally the course of illness or or maybe longer term conditions. Um, so I suppose this is just to get you thinking about that idea that we don't think ourselves as carers and particularly young carers are not inclined to do that because maybe they feel a sense of responsibility often to care for those around them. Um, so uh, there is some resources that help young people to figure out, you know, do you look after your brothers and sisters? Do you have somebody, you know, to have to help somebody with bathing or dressing? Um, maybe do you have to do shopping for the family? Um, and then, you know, looking at what might be the emotional impact for you. So do you ever feel sad or angry or guilty about the help you have to give? Um, and how does that make you feel? How, how does that impact on you emotionally? Um, so these are worthwhile considerations in thinking about how you, how you might be managing yourself as a young carer. Um, we know that for families generally and not just for young carers, um, it's a very difficult situation to have to support somebody without knowledge, without training, without a break, and very often with someone you, you have a strong emotional attachment with. Um, so as a mental health professional myself, I know it's very different working with somebody to support them around their mental health condition as it is when I have to support a family member perhaps with their own mental health um, because the emotions involved are very different and the impact is very different and um, so my response is different and, and that's true of family members as well is that you're often dealing with somebody who you have that strong emotional attachment with but also it means that you have an expertise that nobody else has um, that you, you are expert, expert by experience and that's that's really important that we acknowledge that. It's also important to talk about family recovery so very often when we're talking about mental health recovery we're just talking about individual recovery and really we know it's much broader than that because we're all interconnected and um, we how, how I feel impacts on how my siblings feel uh, at home or my parents, for example, and vice versa. And um, so really, it's, it's about seeing this as all connected and family recovery is about reestablishing our roles, goals, ambitions and life. So it's about everybody's individual pieces, not just one part. Um, and it's about learning to maintain well-being and resilience so that we can continue to support ourselves and each other. Um, so I know I'm conscious that there may be some young carers with us today um, and there may be also just people who are keen to, to learn more about young caring. Um, and some of the key facts around this is that the average age of somebody who's a young carer is about 12. Um, 57 percent of them are in secondary school half of them live with one parent 72 percent cook and clean 50 percent provide general care um, and I suppose something that we don't know as much about because very often in Ireland in particular our facts around young carers have been related to somebody who might be caring um, for someone with a physical health disability um, but we also know that over half of young carers care for somebody with mental health problems. So um, this is just some data that we have from a 2018 study and um, that showed that 66,000 uh, young people in the 10 to 17 age group provided regular unpaid care. So quite a lot of young carers across the country um, providing care and it's increasing. Um, so that's worthwhile. Uh, remembering but again this goes back to many people not seeing themselves as being young carers they think of themselves as a family member or a sibling 
son or daughter and, and presume that that's part of our role within the family. Um, and very often that maybe cuts off a bit of support that might be available to them. So I'm going to just play a little video here now, if that's okay with everybody. So this is just a video about being a young carer. I'm a young carer and I look after my mum. In the morning, I would prepare medication, make sure there's like enough food and stuff like that ready, and then I would go to school. And then I would come back, which is when it gets a bit more intense. The biggest challenge that I face is managing my time between going to school and caring for my mum. Every day is different when you're a carer. Teachers seem to think that we're lazy or we're, we're bored or we can't be bothered. When it's really not that, it's that we have to try and fit in other stuff and scheduling appointments, then we have to go with our parents. It can be really hard for me. For a lot of people like me, it's a big limitation because some of us do want to move up for university or go far, but then we're always thinking back in our minds, okay, but we need to think about how it's going to affect our caring wars at home. So my hope for the future is I don't feel guilty when I have to leave my caring role to fulfill my, my career. Every carer is different, so every carer will need different support. For me personally, it would be getting listened to and so when you're talking that you're being heard however for others it might be something like financial help or more support with schoolwork i've struggled balancing caring with school i had got additional support from a support worker and she's really lovely and we do speak together like once every week and that support has really helped me I think being a young carer has empowered me because now I have this skill set that a lot of people don't usually have. Everyday things like cooking and looking after myself has also helped me become much more mature and the way I basically act within a lot of like, social groups this is giving me a different viewpoint of life. Don't worry about other people labelling you as like, a young carer. It doesn't mean that you're one specific thing. You're not just a carer. You're able to do more than outside of your caring role. A carrier doesn't define a person. If anything, it adds to you, it builds your character. So uh, you heard there, uh, I suppose, the young person talking about uh, the real rewarding effects that this has had for, for them, the caring role has had for them. We also obviously heard about the difficulties that is associated with the role, but would definitely what you can see coming through is that contributing to care and, and this young person's caring for the mother had an effect on uh, their own self-development. So feeling more valued, having a sense of maturity and responsibility, maybe a greater connectedness to the person they care for and having that strengthening relationships. Um, and this is a quote from a young person that says, being a young, per a young carer means I make sure my mom is OK and I can feel proud of myself for ensuring she's safe and stable. So I think it's really important to stress that a lot of young people feel that this is a really rewarding and natural part of maybe their role in their family. But it's not without its challenges. Um, so we know that it, it can often interrupt with skill work. Um, for example, um, another example we have is it often it interrupts with maybe social activities or if you're on a football team or um, a piano team, for example, all of those things make it hard for you to participate in social activities because something might come up. You might need to look after your mom or dad at home and you might need to look after your sibling. Uh, there might be difficulties getting you lifts, for example, places, and, and then you might not be able to participate in the way that you want to. Um, we know that this often affects girls more than it does boys, so it, it can be harder on, on younger girls maybe putting in that role of, of the carer. Um, so there's just some quotes there from, from young carers, Roberta and Amy. I miss a lot of school time because I'm tired, as so I might have been up helping my mum with her tablets during the night. Um, or uh, Amy who cares for her sibling it's, it's hard to sleep because I am um, I sleep on the couch in my sister's room to give my mom and dad a break and it's hard to cope with school the next day because I'm so tired so we can see how it could really impact on on your school 
and uh, how tired you feel and um, you know keeping concentrated and also then how you interact with your friends when you might feel a bit different from other people if they don't have the same responsibilities as you do. Um, so I, I suppose that's a little bit as well about what the young person was talking about in the video we showed there today. So some of the things that you might feel if you are a young carer is you might have difficult thoughts, like you don't really see yourself as a carer. You're not sure that you can help that much um, or you're worried about um, how you can help. You don't understand maybe what's happening or what they're going through. Um, you might be worried about doing the wrong thing or worried about safety or worried about the opinions of others, which is often what a lot of young carers say, that they might feel impacted by the stigma, uh, particularly around mental illness. Um, you might feel that your relationship is impacted um, or changing in some way. Um, and it can be very difficult if, if the person you're supporting might not get help or they push you away or maybe say upsetting things. Um, and, and then that can make you feel a bit overwhelmed or feel helpless in a situation if it's hard to get them the help they need. So I'm going to hand over to my colleague now, Sophie, who's going to talk a little bit about what young carers ask for and what might help young carers in their role. Great, thanks, Elaine. Um, um, so yeah, as Elaine was saying, you know, we know there's um, chat, like obviously there's benefits to and rewards for, from the caring role, but also we know it can be really challenging. And I suppose you know Elaine's gone through a couple of the challenges there, but really sometimes that that lack of information and, and maybe not being included in, in your parents' care plan can be can be really challenging piece. And I suppose maybe you know your expertise and your knowledge of of your parents' difficulties or what they need maybe is is overlooked, and that can be really challenging. And, um, I suppose Bernardo's in Liverpool actually did some research about what it is that young, young carers feel that they need and they want and would be helpful. Um, so we have just a list of these pieces here. So they might ring true for you too. And, and also if maybe if you're a, uh, someone here who's supporting a young carer, they might be helpful things to just um, be aware of as well. So um, number one, um, just, and this is kind of more so for, for those working with your parents and um, we're, we're coming to speak to you is, is just making sure to introduce yourself Tell the young person um, who you are and what your job is and um, give us as much information as you can and um, tell us what's wrong with our parents and um, tell us what's going to happen next. Um, you know, um, often that's a, a real worry for, for young people and, and, and that's fair enough and it might be assumed that the young person has been told that they should know anyway, so making sure that they're told that what's going to happen next and um, talk to us and listen to us and um, remember it's not hard to speak to us, we're not aliens. Um, and, and similar to that, um, you know, ask us what we know and what we think we live with our parents and we know how they've been behaving. So again, you, you probably have the most knowledge of, of how your parents um, how your parents is doing. Um, so then uh, tell us it's not our fault. We can feel really guilty if our mom or dad is ill uh, and we need to know that we're not to blame. And I think that's a really important piece there. Um, you know, again, for, for other people or adults around you, it might be so obvious that it's, it's nothing to do with anything you've done, but um, it's really important that that's, that's explained um, and, and, and that's, that's, you know, that, that's talked to with you. Um, so please don't ignore us. Remember, we're part of the family uh, and we live there too. Um, keep on talking to us and keep us informed. Uh, we need to know what's happening. Um, and most importantly as well, tell us if there's anyone who can support us or someone we could talk to. Um, so I suppose, again, that, that really just highlights the importance of, of including the young person um, or the young carer um, in their parents' Um, in their parents' care plan and what's going on with them because that's it's really important and it can be really reassuring um, for, for the young carer as well. So there might be some some pieces there that you're seeing yourself that uh, could be helpful for you and, and we'll talk about supports for yourself as, as we go on um, through this as well. Um, so caring for you, I suppose going on for that, what, what we would say is, um, you know, uh, you know, as Elaine was saying, you know, you might be caring for your parent and that's just something you do naturally. You feel like maybe it's your responsibility and you mightn't even think of yourself as a carer. And um, I suppose it's important to kind of acknowledge that, um, you know, what it is that you are doing and, and, and the potential impact that that might be having on you as well. And you might be well able to manage, uh, but I suppose within that, it may be to, to support you and your well-being through that is, is really important. So we're just going to look a little bit 
um, about how, how to support yourself in your caring role um, as well. Because um, I suppose what we, you know, an, an important part of that is, is kind of trying to identify your own support needs. And, and I think it's really important to, to notice that, you know, as we know, if, if someone's unwell within a family, um, you know, it, it impacts everybody in the family. Um, and I suppose, particularly for yourself, you might have worries for the future. You know, you have your own personal needs. You know, you have school work or maybe football teams or sports teams you're involved in. You want to hang out with your own friends and do things for you too. Um, so it's important that we're recognising that to still get time to do that and, and to get support, um, you know, um, in your care and role throughout that um, as well. But often it's it's very hard, you know, you might hear, hear the term mind yourself or care care for yourself a lot, but you might be sure how, how exactly do you do that and what is it what is it that I actually need? Um so here are just a couple of questions that might that might help you in that and even to recognize the support that it is that you do provide that maybe you, you might you might do so naturally you, you might um, consider it so much as, as caring yourself. And um, so you might ask yourself, you know, who is it that you care for? Um, what are the things that you do to help others out at home? And um, does anybody else help you? What's a typical day for like for you? And how much do you, time do you spend helping? Um, and as I said, sometimes these are things that you just do at home because that's that's what that's how your family works. Um, but it might be that maybe you're, you're over at Pal's house and you're with your friends and you see how differently fa different families work. Or maybe you're noticing that some of your other friends have more time to, to themselves or to do things that they enjoy. And um, so you might begin to begin to realize that that maybe you're doing a little bit more um, at home. And I think it's you know it's important to, to recognize what it is that, that you actually are doing. Um, and then I suppose following that, then it's about thinking about how does that impact you? How does it make you feel? Um, so, so how does being a young carer make you feel? Um, do I get thanks for what I do? Um, do I worry about the person I look after? Um, how stressed do I feel? Um, uh, who knows about what I do? Um, maybe maybe one or two people in your family know. Maybe your maybe your teachers don't know. Maybe your friends don't know. Uh, maybe they do. Um, so maybe just identifying who who is that support around you and who can you talk to? Um, do I feel that people understand the responsibilities I have? Um, I think that's an important one, particularly around your peer group or, like I said, other supports from school. You know, maybe you're struggling to get your homework done, as as the girl said in the video earlier. Um, maybe yeah. maybe your teachers aren't aware of what's going on at home and, and there might be a bit of a support need there from school too um, and do I wish I had someone to talk to about how I feel so again you so sometimes you might be coping really well with your extra responsibilities but there might be times you know maybe you have exams maybe you're having difficulty I don't know with friendships or things like that where, where these extra responsibilities are, are really difficult and there's there's times you might need to talk to somebody and, and access that little bit of, of extra support as well that would, that's what we'd say is it's really important that you are accessing that support and um, you know and, and checking in with how you feel so I suppose it's looking about around what support is there for you and, and first of all we'd say ask for help um, for people who are close to you such as another member of your family it could be another parent it could be um, an aunt and uncle, a grandparent, a neighbour, um, someone that, that you trust, that you, you feel you could talk to. Um, we'd, we'd encourage you to, to, to ask for help from those around you in that way too. Um, and find out about people outside your family who can provide support and practical help. Um, so, so again, there's, there's different support services that, um, that, that might be able to help you too. It might be someone for you to talk to, or it could be someone to come in and provide a bit of practical support in the house. Um, and again, by talking to someone you trust, it, you know, a, a, a trusted adult really can, can help you access those types of supports. Um, so again, talking to someone you trust about your feelings can really help. And um, there's lots of people who can help um, uh, who you choose will depend on how you feel, who you feel you can trust um, and who you're happy to tell about what goes on at home. And I think that's really important. Um, so picking someone that you feel you have that connection with and you feel safe to talk to about those things. Um, and it's really important um, not to bottle these things up and to let other people know if, if things are starting to get on top of you um, or if you're feeling stressed. But we also know that that's a really hard thing to do um, um, accessing help and talking about it um, too. So, so, so it is difficult. So I think it is about trying to, who are those people in, in your life um, or maybe within your in your network, maybe at school or um, a sports team, there might be someone you, you have a bit, you know, you feel you could talk to and, and get support from as well. 
um, to make time for yourself as well to do things that you want. So again, if you have a lot of responsibilities at home, and um, often that can come ahead of, of things that you enjoy and you get to do for yourself like that, maybe at sports or hanging out with friends. Um, and what we would say in terms of looking after yourself, it's important that you're still making time and, and allowing time for that. And, and maybe it's about, you know, accessing a bit more support so, so that you can have that space, you know, for yourself as well to keep doing those things that are really important mm -hmm. for you too. So I suppose just going on from that piece um, around the self-care, we just have a video. So I'm going to stop sharing here um, and just show you, this is a video from an organization called Mind Space. Um, Mayo and they have kind of resources here for, for young people who support, who, who are parents with, with mental illness or mental health difficulties. Hi, I'm Sarah. And I'm Joe. If someone in your family has a mental health difficulty, maybe it's a parent, then you may experience a whole lot of different feelings about it. And these feelings can range from good everyday feelings that you have just hanging out or having fun with that person through to times when you might be feeling worried about them or yourself or confused or even a bit frightened about what's going on. So it's really important that you make sure you look after yourself. And to get you started on that, here are some tips and some things to think about. Taking care of you, important things you should know. So here's a quick list of things you should know. It's not your fault. You didn't cause it. It's not your job to make it better either. And you are not alone with this. There are many young people who have a parent that struggles with their mental health. It's okay to have feelings about what's going on. Try to talk with an adult or someone that you trust. Do things that you enjoy. Try to balance helping out your family with other things in your life, especially things that are important to you and that you enjoy. So let's go into a bit more detail on these, starting with, it's not your fault. Someone may have said something or you might believe things that make you think that what's going on with your parent is your fault. But that's not the case. You can't cause someone to have mental health problems. Mental health difficulties change how the brain works, its chemical balances, and sometimes its structure. This leads to changes in the way people with these difficulties think, feel, and behave. Just like the body can become unwell, so too can the mind. The good news is that you can't catch a mental health problem like you can catch, say, a cold. Okay, next on the list is, it's not your job to make it better. People with mental health difficulties have lots of things they can choose to do to work towards getting better. So you can't make your parent better by doing stuff or by changing who you are. That doesn't mean that you can't help out, but we'll talk about that a bit more later. Next thing to remember, you are not alone. So there are other kids just like you, maybe even in your class or peer group, who have a parent with mental health issues. They might want to keep that private and not talk about it, but there will be others around you who have a parent with mental health difficulties. They may find it hard to talk about, or they may be managing okay with support from people that they do talk to. Next, it's okay to have feelings about what's going on. You might feel confused, worried, or angry, or sad, or embarrassed at times. They're your feelings, and you're not being disloyal or selfish by having them. You're entitled to feel whatever way you feel about it. It's your unique experience, and it's important. Which leads into the next point. Try to talk with an adult you trust, especially about what's going on for you. That could be a parent, a family friend, or a school counsellor or teacher. Don't bottle it up. Find somewhere safe to get it out, so that the hard feelings don't build up. And if you can't think of someone, then the Childline Helpline is a good place to start. They have people specially trained to talk about what's going on and how you feel about it, and it's a confidential service. It doesn't have to be a crisis to call them. Their number is on screen. Sometimes it might feel like it's all just too much. That's the time when it's really important to talk to someone about what's going on for you. You might also be thinking that you want to talk to your parent with the mental health difficulty about what's happening. You don't have to, of course, but if you did, a good way to start is to find a time when it feels okay to say something like, I've noticed that you seem to be really sad lately and I'm worried. Can we talk about what's going on? Sad may not be the right word. Choose a word or description that fits. You might say angry, anxious, worried, 
crying a lot, staying in bed a lot. Describe whatever you notice. Another important tip is to create time that's just for you, so you can do things that you enjoy. It's important to have fun and not feel guilty about it. Last point, it's okay to help out around the house. Helping out is what we do in families, but make sure you balance it with other things that are important in your life, like seeing friends, hobbies, schoolwork, and having fun. If these things are getting hard for you to do, or you feel overwhelmed when you try to do them, then reach out and talk to someone. You might hear other people say things about mental health that are just hurtful or just plain wrong. Sometimes people don't understand what they haven't experienced. So even though a lot of families have someone with a mental health difficulty, it's something that doesn't get talked much about. So some people might not understand what you're going through. And if you are being teased or bullied because your parent has a mental health difficulty, then talk to a teacher or a school counsellor. There's a lot of other information that you might find helpful on yourmentalhealth.ie and there are other videos on this website that explain a little about parental mental health and recovery that you might want to watch. So take care of yourself. So again, yeah, um, just gonna share, sorry. Um, really hopefully that gave you some tips around um, how to kind of mind yourself as well, because you know we often hear the term self-care and it's hard to know um, where to start with that. But really what, what is key is that you are prioritizing kind of what you need to do to mind yourself in that. And they're the, the things like getting support in school and doing the activities you enjoy and, and also really just kind of checking in with how you feel about it and, and talking to someone um, if, if, you, if, you feel, if you feel you need to speak to someone as well. Um, and we'll also talk a little bit in, in a moment about how, how you might talk to, to even your own parent who, who, is, who needs care as well around, um, around how you're feeling and, and, and what maybe they need as well. Um, but again, in terms of if you are thinking about coming up with a self-care plan and um, for yourself, I suppose it's important to remember there's no one size fits all option and um, we all have different needs, strengths and limitations. Um, but maybe it could be no harm to if you feel like you're, you're struggling and you need a bit of support um, uh, or, or you need to kind of think about what's going to help you going forward. And these four steps can, can be helpful um, in that sense, too. So number one there is kind of evaluate your, your coping skills. So how do you typically deal with stress? And um, can you identify when you need to take a break? And um, often what might happen is that it's it's when you've kind of reached the point of, of burnout or, or, or being too stressed is the point that you that you realize um your stress is also are you able to what are maybe the signs that you that you are struggling a bit or that you need a bit of support and um, so maybe getting a sense of, of how you manage with with that and, and, and what helps there can be helpful um, and number two there so identify your self-care needs so what are you doing to support your overall well-being on a day-to-day -day basis so again that's different for everybody and um, some people it's it's good routine and structure getting up at the same time every day going to bed at the same time every day and making time for friends and and school work and, and getting support um, around those things as well um, but also within that, it's really important to kind of, when you're thinking about how to mind yourself in that way, think of kind of maybe what, what are some barriers and what are some areas for improvement? So what are things that stop you from being able to, to, to do what you need to do to mind yourself? And, and sometimes they're practical things that, that maybe, um, maybe you have to be at home at a certain time when you can't attend the, the activity that you want to attend. Um, and, and maybe that's thinking about, well, what needs to change there and, and who can support me in that um, as well? So maybe thinking through those those three steps, and then and then number four is 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 sitting down to actually um, draw out your your self care plan there as well. Um, but again, you, you know, accessing support with that um, as much as we can. Too. So I suppose another piece within this um, as well is, you know, you can have a self-care plan and, um, you know, and you can think of what's going to support you when, when things become a little bit too much. But sometimes in the moment, you know, you might just be struggling and you need a bit of support for yourself 
here and now and then maybe there isn't someone right beside you to chat to you so I suppose something that that we find can be helpful as well is, is using um, positive coping statements um, and I suppose this these kind of encourage us to help um, cope through distressing times and so these are kind of um, words you can say to yourself and um, to kind of coach yourself through these moments when when maybe you're you're, you're in, a, in a particular different you're you're feeling a strong feeling or, or you're in a difficult um, moment of your day and um, so these are things like just reminding yourself um, you know this will pass you know taking a moment to breathe and reminding yourself you can do this maybe if you've done it before you can do it again um, also recognizing that if you're feeling really angry or anxious or sad about the situation and um, that's okay and, and that's valid to feel that um, and and also you, you can still do it while feeling those feelings too and um, you know I've done this before I can do it again and um, this feels bad but I suppose but that's a normal reaction as well and, and knowing that it will pass and, and that you have gotten through these these difficult um, times before and um, but really what we'd say alongside that is is, is also accessing support and talk to someone as well as we need to through that um, as well and um, another another piece that um, can be helpful as well is, is mindfulness and um, maybe you've heard about this a lot maybe you've never tried it before but really I suppose taking that moment it's really about taking that moment to pause and be present and, and use your breath to help you in that and um, so um, and, and it you know often you think you might have to sit and, and meditate for, for half an hour but it's even just one minute or two minutes can, two minutes can really help you um, at different times and some people do this at the start and end of every day some people do it when, when they need to but I suppose it can be a helpful um, exercise to, to do to, to support you in times where, where you need that bit of space um, so we have a little video just to it's a, just a one minute exercise to, to give you an example of of um, of, of meditation and, and how you might be able to use it so sitting comfortably, just taking a big deep breath in through the nose, out through the mouth. As you breathe in, noticing how the body expands. As you breathe out, just watching the body soften as you gently close the eyes. And rather than the mind leading the breath, allow the breath to lead the mind. Notice the sensation of the breath. Notice it where you feel it in the body. If you need to, you can just gently place your hand on the stomach. And just following that rising and falling sensation. Nothing else to do. Allowing thoughts to come and go. And when you're ready, just gently opening the eyes again. Um, I already feel a bit relaxed after that. Um, I think the video as well. I think sometimes I definitely find it hard to meditate at times, and having something visual to look at can be helpful too. But that's Headspace. They have an app, um, and I think they have a lot of free meditations if that's any help to you as well. And um, but sometimes just taking that time to pause, and like that, it could be just that that one minute um, as well, just to. Um, to fit in, you can have it on your phone or something like that and just take take time in your room or wherever you feel comfortable to, to do that um, as well. Um, so I just can share it, that's coming up again. Um, okay. um, so, uh, so as I said, we, we, so we're, what we're going to look at now is kind of caring for others and, and what's, what that's like um, as well. And, um, often it can be really difficult to know. Sometimes, you know, we, we know exactly how to support someone. And I think Elaine kind of touched on this before that sometimes if someone has maybe physical health or physical care needs, it's a little bit easier to know maybe what somebody does need or, or need support with. Maybe they need help getting out of bed or help with meals and those practical pieces. But I suppose if some if your parent has a mental health illness or mental health difficulty, that, that caring role can be a little bit more difficult to know how to support and and um 
and sometimes um, and also it can be difficult to broach those conversations around how to support someone as well and um, so here's just a little piece on kind of how you might broach those conversations and what we'd say is as we said kind of throughout um the presentation is, is the importance of communication and talking about how you're feeling what and and within that i suppose it's okay to 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 talk to to your parent about maybe what it is that they need and and often there might be worries that god will this upset them more or not and and i think uh, you know really it's about just just trying to maybe find a time that things are settled um and and uh, you know your parent is feeling relatively okay you can broach these times and the time that you're feeling okay yourself as well and um, to broach this this conversation because it, it can really ultimately help help them a little bit more and help you to, mm -hmm. to know how to support them too and um, so it can be helpful to have an open discussion with the person about the illness its management and how you can um uh, how you can help maze this both you you both deal with it and um, so the timing of the the discussion is important and it's best to do this when the person themselves feel ready and is relatively well so as we said and um, so keep the keep the lines of communication open but also try to avoid conversations dominated by discussing the illness so Again, it's it's nice to you know ha try and have that balance, and um, but you know it's important to have these conversations too, but but also that um, you can you can have your normal chats um, as well, um, and use language that's comfortable for you, and um, ask what you can what you can do to help. Many people need time to figure out what might be helpful, so it can be helpful to to suggest a return to the conversation if necessary. So you might be saying, "Listen, you know I've noticed this. It's what can I do? You know, is there anything I can be doing differently?" Maybe they're caught a little bit off guard or they're not really sure of themselves and you know it's okay to, to say listen have a think about it and can we come back to it um as well so um really it is about just trying to, to keep those those lines of communication open um and and just saying it is about what you're noticing and, and what what you can what what they what, and then coming back to you about what what you maybe could, could do um, and it might be as we said coming back to that at a later point um, so I suppose another piece that could be really helpful for you in, in your care and role as well is, is information and, and there's, you know, I suppose there's huge empowerment in, in information. And so I suppose really what, what can be helpful is accessing timely and quality information and can be really beneficial for yourself and your loved one. And however, we do recognize that it's not easy to access the information that you need. Um, and this, because, this could be because information is not shared with you um, or you're not provided with specific of details and particularly as a young carrier as we talked about earlier you might be excluded from that um, and information provision is not timely so you're not getting information that you know it, it, um, soon as 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 quickly as, as it should be given to you um, and issues may change overlap or develop over time um, I suppose just um, and, and often that's the piece of of staying linked in with maybe your your or for, for your parents treating team or medical team to, to be linking in with you and and uh, I suppose that should be that best practice that you are included in that and um, that doesn't always happen I suppose knowing that it's okay to ask for that and um, to um, but also if you are looking for kind of general information on around mental health or mental illness and and maybe how to support um, your parent or, or support that's out there for you I suppose here's a couple of a couple of links and, and organizations that that might be helpful for you as well so so different mental health organizations that rethink mental illness there's mind um, and mental health Ireland um, and then the Royal College of Psychiatrists there's lots of information around different mental health illness and diagnosis there. Um, the HSC also run a family connections program that's for uh, relatives and, and family members of, of someone with a diagnosis of borderline personality disorder or emotionally unstable personality disorder. So that's a resource that could be helpful for you as well. Um, but also specifically for, for um, young people who have a, a parent with mental health illness, there's COPE, which is an Australian organisation that's uh, children of parents with mental illness. And there's also Mindspace Mail, so the video we watched during self-care was, was from them as well. So they all have lots of, lots of different useful information for you as well. Um, but also you might be looking for more, you know, as we said, more information for yourself, Mindspace Mail, there's the link there. Um, but also Family Carers Ireland, they have uh, support, direct support for um, young, young carers as well. So you can find that um, in the young carers section of their website um, there as well. They offer um, different support and information there as well, which might be helpful for you. 
you might be thinking though also that you know maybe there's wider support needs for your family and um, or if you're person supporting you know a, a young carer these are different kind of organizations that might be helpful Bernardo's two slits uh, child line uh, family carers Ireland as we talked about there and um, so lots, lots of different supports there as well um, and I suppose for individual one-to-one -one support for young people there is jigsaw and um, as well which you might have heard about um, too so there's kind of a list of of the different kind of resources that that we've looked at uh, or, or that the presentation was drawn from as well just for your reference as well but I might stop sharing there and um, I know there's a lot of information in what we talked about, but maybe if anybody has any questions or um, comments. We, do, I, we haven't had any questions so far, but I think it, it's important to remember as well that this uh, recording will be available and we can make the resources available to anybody if they'd like to have them shared with them uh, today. So if we've no questions, um, which I don't think we have, we will end the webinar for today. Thank you all for joining us. Um, and uh, please feel free to, to look to our website, uh, St. Patrick's Mental Health Services website, where we have family information videos available on a range of different issues that may be helpful for you. And the Mindspace Mayo, particularly for young carers, is a website that could be really helpful. Um, and again, if you'd like to, to know more about some of the resources we've just discussed today, please do get in touch. Thank you. Thanks so much. Bye.